your Holy Spirit rain down upon us and saturate us. Lord, not just for the moment. Let there be a refilling. You said to be filled with the Spirit, but that needs to be refilled. And that's what we're doing here tonight. So, Father, rain down upon us. Let the Holy Spirit flow over us tonight. In Jesus' name. We're honored. Miss Ava is going to come speak to us tonight. We're honored to have very capable men and women of God to come and to speak into house. Amen. So give Miss Ava a hand as she comes and ministers the word tonight. share the word that God has laid on my heart, and I thank Sister Renee and Bishop Matthews for this opportunity, and I just thank you for each one of you that are here. I'm getting the sign. Put it up there. Okay. <laughs> We're going to be, I'm not sure if the pa if a preacher's showing up here or teacher, uh, just exactly which mantle I'm going to be wearing tonight, so I just ask you to to, to bear with me and just we'll just see what happens it could be a little bit of preaching a little bit of teaching and a little bit of I don't know what but I definitely feel like I have a word that the Lord laid on my heart and I just I just hope I can do justice to what he has given me so just hang with me okay <laughs> all right we are going to go into the scriptures tonight we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 25 and I'm going to read all of it right now if you want to uh, okay, we've got it up here. I'm going to read all of it, and then I'm going to break it down and share with you what God is wanting us to do. He's wanting us to start stirring. We need to start stirring. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Father, help us, Lord, just as we go into your word tonight, Lord. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is speaking to us, Father. Open our hearts to receive it, Lord. God, I ask that you help me, Father, just to deliver your word as you've placed it in me, Father. There'll be no part of me in this. And Lord, I ask that you just help me, Father, to, to bring to light the things that you want us to do, Father, because the time is drawing near. The time is drawing near. The day is approaching, Father. And we need to be busy stirring up what it is that you want us to do. So I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And I thank you for what you are going to do in this service tonight. I thank you, God, for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What stirs you up? What stirs you up? What gets you going? What gets you excited about something? Something to think about. This morning I saw a picture. Actually, it was yesterday morning I saw a picture. And um, forgive me for using this particular sports team in case that isn't your favorite, but it's really not a matter of who was in the picture. It was what the picture represented. But before the game, before the Kentucky Wildcat game yesterday, there was a picture of the team members. And I don't know where they were, but I think it was in their practice gym. And they were all gathered together in a circle. And you could just see their arms circled around each other. And they were pulled in close, and their coach was standing there. And it didn't say what they were doing. It didn't say 
what was being said, but you just had this, this picture of this circle, and they were all touching each other, and they were close. And in this gym, you could see banners that were hung up on the wall representing the championships that they had won in the past. They were getting stirred up for the next game. I recently got stirred up to run, um, and it happened, not really something that I wanted to do. I've never been a runner. I really don't like exercise, and I walk, but I don't really like to do that either. But last year, we were invited to come and watch my grandson run in his first 5K. He is nine years old. My stepson was running with him. Now, I've been to 5Ks, but there was just something different this time. You know, we, we, we watched all along the way as they progressed, and then we were at the finish line, and, and everybody was coming through at different times, and they were just, you know, so excited when they crossed that finish line. There was applause. You know, everyone was cheering, and, and you could see the look on their face, even though they were exhausted. You could see the satisfaction you know, with themselves for having finished. It was just exciting. It was exciting to be there, and, and I could feel this fire kind of starting, like, you know, I could do this. I'd like that. I think I can do this. I don't know. But I, I could just feel the stirring, that this might be something I could do. At the last intersection of the race, I was standing there watching for Chris and Ethan to come through, and I wish I could show you the picture, but if I did, I don't think it would, it still wouldn't do justice to what I saw. You have to know that my stepson, Chris, is about 6'4", um, very athletic, and Ethan is a very small nine-year-old. He's just, he's just so, he's so small, he's so fragile looking. And as I'm standing there on the corner watching the runners come in, here comes Chris and Ethan. And Chris is holding Ethan's hand. And he's, he's, he's running with Ethan. Now, Chris probably could have finished the race minutes, I mean, a long time before, but he was running this race with Ethan. And he's holding his hand. And I'm watching that as they come across the intersection. And besides being, being proud of watching a father doing that with his son, and the stirring that was going on in me, I'm thinking about the picture of that, the picture of our Heavenly Father running the race with us. Our hand is in his hand. He's right there with us. Needless to say, I was stirred, and that was last year. And I did start running, and I did, and I did finish a few races. And that was my goal, to be perfectly honest, was to just finish. <laughs> I had no no concerns about where I was going to finish. Just finishing was good enough, and I did. This season came around, and I'd made up my mind that I wasn't going, you know, I did it. That's done. I don't need to do this anymore. I'm not even going to try. But I got those tags that you wear when you're racing, your bib numbers, and had a couple of medals that I won. And I put those up in my room to encourage me. It's a memorial that I have in place to remind me of past successes. And I look at it every day before I go out to run, and it reminds me that I did this before. I can do it again. Well, this morning, I was going to go out for my run, and, and I could see that uh, I was looking at my memorial and thinking about it, and looked outside on the deck, and I could see the rain, and it was wet out there, and I could see the rain in the forecast, and, you know, I don't know, maybe it's fear of getting a little wet or something, I don't know, but I just really wasn't anxious to get my shoes on and go outside and run today. Maybe I'd lost a little bit of my zeal, I don't know. Looked like I was going to have to make a trip down to the basement to get on the treadmill instead. And that is a zeal killer for sure. So I went on through the house, and I'd pretty much made up my mind that I wasn't going to run today. And came back through, and I looked, and the sun was shining. <laughs> so I stopped everything, which was 
working on my message, and I probably should have spent a little more time in there. But anyway, I decided to go ahead and stop everything that I was doing and get moving. Where I run, there's a loop around our house that is exactly a half a mile. So it's a, I get to just keep going in circles, and I know exactly how far I've run, so it makes it really easy to time. Well, I got out there, and I did my first mile, and I was, you know, kind of pleased with myself. I had a pretty good time, but I started to notice that the sky was getting really dark in one direction. And as I was running, I could even feel some raindrops were starting to come down, and my pace quickened a little bit. You know, I didn't want to abandon this run. I was out there, and I was in this thing. And as I was coming around the corner, though, all of a sudden the sun was shining brightly over on this side. And I went back around another corner, and then all of a sudden there was these dark clouds again. But it was pretty clear that if I wanted to complete this run, I was going to have to get stirred up and get moving. Because like those dark clouds that were coming, the day is approaching. The day is approaching. So where do we need to start with this getting stirred up? Let's go back to um, verse 19 and see where we need to get started. We need to get stirred up, therefore, brother, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. And the first place that we need to get started stirring is in our prayer life. We need to get started stirring up in our prayer life. In Hebrews 4.16, we're told to let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Have you lost your cutting edge in your prayer life? Something to think about. It is possible for that to happen. There's a story in 2 Kings, and this is a a familiar story. You've you've heard it, but it, it, um, it takes place when a servant is doing some work. And as one was cutting down a tree, the servant was cutting down a tree, the axe head, the axe that he was using, the axe head fell off of it, and it fell into the water. He cried out, and he said, Alas, Master, it was borrowed. He was really upset. He had borrowed this axe to do this good work, and now he had lost the axe head. Luckily, the man of God was standing right there beside of him, and he said, Where did it fall? So the servant showed him the place. So the man of God cut off a stick, and he threw it in there into the water, And when he did, he made the iron float. He made the axe head actually float up. And he said, pick it up for yourself. And he reached out his hand and he took it. In this story, the servant had borrowed an axe to do a good work. And sometimes I think that maybe our prayer life slides to the back burner because we're busy doing a good work. Would you agree with that? There's times that we're doing so many things, and they're good things. But then finding that time to pray just doesn't happen. In the process, the servant was doing his good work, and he lost his cutting edge. And sometimes we do too. Thankfully, the man of God, Elisha, was standing right there. He was close by. So the servant turned to the one, the only one who could help him the man of God, or in our case, straight to God. And the man of God tossed the stick in the water, and a miracle happened, and the axe head was restored. If we've lost our cutting edge, what do we need to do? We need to examine our prayer life, first of all, and see if our passion to pray is still there. And if it isn't, we can go to the one who gave it to us in the first place. We can go straight to God. It's very easy to get lost in doing many, many good things, but it's time to look to the one who can help us restore our passion for prayer. We need to stir up our passion for prayer, and all we need to do is to ask him to do that. The word says in Ezekiel 36, 26, that I will give you a new heart 
and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, if only we will ask. In Jeremiah 29, he says, if you will seek me, you'll find me, and when you search for me with all of your heart, you'll be found. All we need to do. We need to stir up this zeal for prayer. Listen to this, Isaiah 42, 13. And I know I'm taking you through a lot of scriptures, but there's a reason for that. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man, and he will stir up his zeal like a man of war. He will stir up his zeal like a man of war. He will cry out, yes, shout aloud, and he will prevail against his enemies. I have held my peace for a long time. I have been still and restrained myself. Now I will cry like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. That's Isaiah 42, verses 13 and 14. We need to have a zeal in our prayers where we are like a man of war, where we are going to cry out, be willing to cry out aloud and prevail against the enemy. That's the kind of zeal we need in our prayer time. So we need to stir up our prayer life. We need to get our cutting edge back, and we need to stir up our zeal. That's one thing that God wants us to do. Let's see what else we need to stir up. Verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When I mentioned this to my husband, he says, Well, what are you going to be preaching on tonight? Do you have any idea where the Lord's leading you? And I said, Well, He's, the Lord's wanting us to stir things up. He's wanting things to get stirred up. And he said, as soon as I said that to him, he said, I immediately began to think about an agitator in a washing machine. And when you think about that, the water and the, the, the soap suds in there and the process that goes through to get our clothes clean, God's wanting us to stir up that cleansing in ourselves as well. Psalms 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Isaiah 64, verses 6 through 8 say, We are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself stirs himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us with our iniquities. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and all we are the work of your hands. We need to begin making sure that we take that time to confess our sins to him, that we we come to him and lift up the things that we haven't done or the things that we we do that we shouldn't do or the things that we know to do and we don't do. We just need to make sure that we take that time to spend time with him to confess our sins. And he tells us in 1 John 1, 9 that if we will do that, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all unrighteousness. We need to stir up our prayer life. We need to get our cutting edge back. We need to stir up our zeal for prayer. We need to stir up that cleansing. We need to make sure that we're going before the Lord and and, and asking him to create a clean heart in us. What else do we need to stir up? There's some more things he's wanting us to stir up. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. We need to stir up our hope. We need to stir up. This is some things we need to do. We need to stir that hope up inside of us. Lamentations 3, 20 through 24 says, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. They are great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Stir up your hope. Stir up your hope because he is faithful. We need to stir up our faith. We need to stir up our faith. 
Now think about this story for a minute. It was in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And we're talking about faith. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Jesus talking to his disciples, he said, let's cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were beating into the boats that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said, Teacher, do you care not that we are perishing? Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he looked to them, and he said... Why were you so fearful? How is that you have no faith? And then they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They knew who he was. They had seen what he could do. He had even already taught them what they could do. Yet they were in this situation out in this boat, and he had such confidence that they knew what to do that he was asleep. And yet the storm arose, and the fear rose up, and the lack of faith fell. So they did the only thing that they knew to do, and that was to wake Jesus up. And Jesus said to him, you know, what, what, why are you so fearful? What's going on? You know what to do. That's okay. I got it this time. I'll take care of it for you. And they were in wonder, you know. Who is this guy? Even the wind and the sea obey him. We need to stir up our faith to overcome fear. We need to stir it up and to overcome our fear and do what we know to do. Speak out. God's given us. I mean, we have that power within us to speak to the storm. We have that power. We need to use it. That's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. You knew what to do. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We need to stir up our faith. We need to stir up our faith so that we can overcome the fear that stops us from doing some of the things that we need to do. Jesus was getting ready to send his disciples out. He told them everything they needed to do. He had empowered them. He told them what was going to happen to them. You can read all the details in Matthew 10, but I'm going to pick out a few of, the, few of the verses. And he's preparing to send them out, and he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. He goes on to say, Do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. And he says again a little bit later, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He goes on to say, Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So he was sending his disciples out and not necessarily painting a pretty picture, but at the same time he was saying, do not fear. You have nothing to worry about. You are of more value than the sparrows. I'm going to take care of you. We need to do the same thing. We need to stir up our faith to overcome fear because he's with us. He's going to be right there with us along the way and help us to accomplish what needs to be done. What else do we need to stir up? As if that's not enough. It seems like we have a lot of stirring to do, don't we? Verse 24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. When you think about the word consider, it means to perceive, to remark, to observe to understand another person or other people. You need to consider attentively that person. You need to fix your eyes and your mind on them. 
and in order to stir up love, and in order to stir up good works in them. You need to pay attention. You need to focus in on them. He's calling us to stir up our focus on others, to stir up our love, to stir up our compassion for others, to focus on someone else's needs more than our own. There's a lot of reasons why we need to do this. There's several scriptures that tell us what happens when there's a lack of love. Proverbs said that a soft answer will turn away wrath, but a harsh word will stir up anger real quick. And if only we would learn to practice love and compassion before we respond with that harsh word. In Proverbs 15, 18, it says that a wrathful man or woman uh, stirs up strife. But he who is slow to anger allies contention. Proverbs 10, 12 said that hatred stirs up strife. But you know what? Love covers all sins. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 28 and 25 said, He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9 says, Finally, all of you be of one mind. Have compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. He is calling us to love one another, to stir up that love inside of us for others. We also need to stir up in other people good works. We need to stir up good works. And I have to think that if we are focusing on other people and we're stirring up our love and we're doing good works and, and, and helping others, that is an inspiration to that person to begin to stir up their own love and to begin to do good things. But also we need to think about this. In Haggai 1, uh, verses 13 through 14, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit. And I'm going to skip all the names. He stirred up a spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came to work on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. He stirred up a spirit in the people to come and work. Exodus 35 and 21, the same kind of stirring happened. He said, then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing, and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of the meeting. Exodus 36 and 2, the same thing. The gifted artisans in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred, their hearts were stirred to come and do the work. 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 through 7, he says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift. You stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We need to stir up our love for others. We need to stir up the good works in others. We need to stir up a willingness to work in ourselves, to come back to the temple, to come to this place and work because the workers are needed. The workers are needed to come back into the temple. We don't have enough people to do all the things that need to be done. There are too many people that do multiple jobs. We need to stir up. We need to stir people to good works. Another thing we need to stir up is our desire to gather together and to exhort each other. Verse 25 says, For forsaking, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It is so important, it is so important for us to come together into this place, to the temple, to gather, to start each week together. It's so important that we give him the first part of our week in worship, that we come here to hear the word, and that we encounter God. We need that. We need that in us. We need that in order to accomplish the things that he wants us to do. 
And we, it, it shouldn't be second choice. It shouldn't be something that we choose to do when there's nothing else going on. It ought to be our first choice to want to come into the temple and gather together. But there's another step to this. There's something else that we need to do. We need to purpose to become a part of, and in our case here, our life groups. Now, this is the life group coordinator coming out here, and maybe a little bit of preacher and teacher too. But it is so important when we gather together because that is the part where we are being equipped. That is the part where we can be exhorters and be exhorted in order to accomplish the things that God has for us to do. That's where this happens. We come here, we encounter God, and we need to do that. We need to worship him, and we encounter him here in this place. But then we go out and join into our life groups so there in that place we can begin to learn a little bit more in detail about the word of God, and we can learn from each other, and we can love on each other, and we can connect with each other. It is so important because that is where we're going to be empowered to be able to engage the culture. It's a three-step process, and we need to do that. And that is what this, I mean, this, you know, this is what God's Word is saying that we need to do. We need to purpose to be here, and we need to gather together. It's so important that we do that. In the temple setting, and, and we love being here in the temple together, but there's rarely enough time to really get to connect with someone. I mean, you get to see somebody, and you get to see that, you know, the, the family's all here together, and you may get to say a hi, hello, how are you doing? But it, I don't get to find out if your children are sick or if there's something that's going on this week that's really important with you that I can be praying with you about. I don't get to find out about the things that, that God's done in your life because there isn't enough time to meet with and get to talk to and 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 share that with every single person that's in this place. In fact, there's sometimes that I come into the temple on Sundays and, and I have to think that I even get to talk to anybody at all because we get busy doing some of the things that we need to do, you know, to really beyond just saying hi. And sometimes I think I miss that too. It's so important that we assemble together and get involved in a life group. I can't tell you how important it is. Everyone should be a part of one. We need people who need, you know, talking about stirring up to work. We need people who want to step into that role. God's gifted people to be able to be a life group host or leader. All you have to do is have a compassion for other people and have a place that you can meet and gather together. It's not hard. But we have so many of our leaders that are willingly leading life groups when in fact there's other people that could be leading those life groups and the leaders could be a part of it so they can get fed too. Just, just saying. <laughs> okay, we need to be thinking of that because we need to be stirring that up. We need to be stirring up people to do good work. So maybe I'm stirring you up a little bit with that. We need to gather together so we can stir up each other in the word. That's what Jesus did. In fact, he stirred them up so much that that was one of the things they held against him. And they were fierce and saying, he stirs up people, teaching throughout all of Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Something that we need to do. We get in the word and we get stirred up. We start stirring each other up in our life groups or when we're joined together in small groups when we can begin talking about the memorials and the monuments and the things that God has done for us in our lives. We get to share those with one another. Joshua, um, in Joshua 4, verses 20 through 24, um, asked the elders to pick up 12 stones from out of the middle of the Jordan and bear in mind that the seas have been parted now. So they were going out into the, the bed of the, the waterway and picking up rocks to take with them. And he was doing this for a purpose. He spoke to the children of Israel and he said, Now, when the children ask their fathers in time to come, what are these stones? Then you will let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had to cross over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea when he dried up before us until we crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. It is so important. Those stones were going to be in place so that they could be reminders 
were the fathers to tell their children of what God had done in their life. We need to gather together and hear these testimonies of what God has done in our own lives. It's just like my little memorial that I have set up to what I accomplished in the past of my running, we need to have the same thing before us, sharing what God has done in our lives because it encourages us. Before, you know, even when I'm hearing myself tell the story of something that God has done for me, it encourages me because it reminds me that, you know, in this situation, God came through. He was there with me through it. So here I am in another situation, and I can remember, well, if God did it then, he'll do it again. That's right. And so when we tell that to ourselves, we find ourselves in a similar, ba a similar battle, and we're encouraged. But not only that, when we're sharing our testimony of what God has done with others, they may be going through something. And they're encouraged by what God has done in your life because we can open up and we can share those things. We need to stir up and awaken our faith with the reminders of how God has moved in the past. Because the day is approaching. Just like those dark clouds that I saw this morning, we need to start stirring. We need to awaken our faith. We need to go back and, and revisit and think about and learn about the times when God moved mightily in revivals. When we think back to Cane Ridge and Azusa Street and all these, you know, Brownsville, and, and I'm sure that there's even people sitting on pews right here that can think back to times when they've seen God move mightily in their services and times of revival and miracles that happened. We need to tell those stories and revisit it, not to go back into the past, not to try to redo something that God has done, but to remind us once again that if God did it then, he'll do it again and can do it again. We need to stir up our faith. God wants us to start doing a whole lot of stirring. The day is approaching. There's not much time, just like the dark clouds that I saw this morning. As I was walking around my yard last night preparing for this message, I really didn't have any idea what it was that I needed to share. I don't know what other people do when they prepare for a message, but I began praying, of course. That's the first thing you would want to do. God, you know, tell me something. And I had a lot that was stirring in my own spirit. God was stirring a lot of things. I've been reading a book by Priscilla Shire called Fervent. She was talking about our fervency in prayer and, and, and becoming more passionate about our prayer time. And in our small group, we're studying Follow by Andy Stanley. And it's just tearing us up. I mean, just some of the things that we need to be doing. And so that's stirring in me and thinking about that and thinking about all the monu monuments and memorials of all the things that God's been doing in the past. These things have just been rolling around in my head lately. I've had a passion and anger that has just risen up lately in my own prayer time. A passionate anger, I guess, is a good way to say, but I've just been mad about cancer and Alzheimer's and diseases that are stealing the minds of our generation that we need to be hearing from them the things that have been going on. And this demon is just continuing to steal these things. I'm so sick of hearing the word cancer. I mean, I'm just sharing. This has just been me. This has been something that I've been dealing with and just trying to, you know, just getting mad about it. And, and that has stirred me up in my prayer time. I'm sick and tired of hearing about all these illnesses and diseases and conditions that are attaching themselves to people. And it almost seems like sometimes people are attaching themselves to them too. We've been hearing some powerful testimonies, even in our own group, our own small group, about God's faithfulness. He's so good. And yet I still see so many people that it seems like they are hidden away in caves in fear. Fearful to do anything. Fearful to step out. Fearful to do what God's called them to do. Fearful to take a stand. Yet, I hear God calling out the Gideons like pastor preached on Sunday to come out of the cave. 
He's stirring us up. He's trying to stir us up. But I'm walking through my, I call it my prayer park because it's a large area with lots of trees. And because we have lots of trees, we have lots of sticks. So I'm walking around in a circle, literally. I have a thing about circles. I'm just walking and praying and walking and praying and feeling the stirring inside of me. And and I, I reach over and I pick up the stick. He says, start stirring. Start stirring. Why do you start stirring? angel went down at a certain time into a pool and stirred up the water and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had if you've been over to if you've been able to overlook my delivery or lack of it we've been through a lot of scriptures tonight and God is speaking just as loudly as he can There's some things we need to start stirring up because the day is near. We need to get busy. We need to stir up our faith and a faith that will overcome whatever fear you might have of doing the thing that God has called you to do. I have no doubt that the waters have been stirred tonight because I know my God. Oh my God. And tonight, it's not like it was then when the first person who stepped in got the healing for tonight. It's for every single one of us that hears this. That we need to start stirring. We need to start stirring. Can you stand up, please? There's some things that I'm going to say right now. Some things that I feel like God's really wanting to stir up in us tonight. And I'm not big on begging people or even asking people or telling you how to respond. God takes care of that. But I know for sure that tonight God's wanting to stir up some faith. He's trying to stir up a faith that's going to override fear. We have the same power in us that raised Jesus from the dead. And just like the disciples, he's given us everything we need to speak to the storm and to quiet the waves. Everything we need. But maybe, you know, you still feel that water creeping up over your feet and your ankles and the sound of the wind and the power of the waves is tempting you to go deep into the cave. You don't know what to do. You're ready to run in fear. Don't. Please don't. Turn to Jesus because he is with you. He is right there with you in whatever situation it is that you are facing. All you have to do is call on his name. In that faith, we need to stir up healing. Isaiah 53 and 5 said he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. We're, it's already done. We just need to stir up our faith. God's wanting to stir up our zeal. We need our cutting edge returned. We need our cutting edge returned. And the only way to do that is to go to the one who put the passion in you in the first place. He wants to restore it. He wants to restore it. He wants to send the rain to wash over you. All you need to do is ask him and then stand there with arms wide open and your face turned up to him and be drenched in his rain. In his rain. Just ask him. Hosea 6, 3 says, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord for his going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. 
He wants to restore our zeal and our prayer time. He wants to restore our love. He wants to restore our desire to work and to stir up the gifts within us. He's wanting to stir up hearts that'll come willingly, to come willingly and be ready to be used. The gifts that's already in them to be placed in use in his kingdom. He's trying to stir that up. He's stirring up the labor pains. I didn't even know if I wanted to say this tonight, but I had written it down over a year ago. I stood in this house, this very place, and said that this would be a delivery room, a birthing place of dreams. I know enough to know about seeds being planted and how long it takes for a seed to develop. That there are times come, time comes and it needs to be birthed. And the labor pains need to start. This is a birthing place of dreams and God has already implanted those dreams. But we've got to stir up the faith. We've got to stir up the zeal. We've got to stir up our desire to work willingly and to have our gifts be used. We need to stir it up. The time has come for us to step out in faith and do the thing that you've been called to do. It's time for God is with you. Time for faith to rise up, to override the fear. I'm going to pray. And I want you to respond the way that you want to respond. I've shared with you everything that God's given for me to tell you. So I thank you. I thank you for hearing this. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I just come before you and I just want to declare. I declare, Lord, that this is a time of faith. I declare that faith is rising up in this congregation of people, Father, that there is a faith riding that will override 